pleasure to have Dr. Hotata Shiokawa uh, to talk to us about the black hole simulation. And uh, Dr. Shiokawa uh, got his bachelor's degree at the University of Arizona. Then he received his PhD degree at the University of Illinois uh, Urbana Machine Team. And he did his first postdoc at uh, Johns Hopkins University. And he joined the Center for Astrophysics uh, last year, and uh, he is part of the Invent Horizon Telescope um, program. And okay. Uh uh, hello everyone, so I'm going to talk about time variable radiative model of such as A. So such as A is a supermassive black hole at the center of Milky Way galaxy, and we try to model its accretion disk and emission from accretion disk using numerical simulations. Um, we especially focus on time variability of the emission, uh, basically short time scale variability of a couple of minutes to less than one hour, that primarily uh, originates from turbulence in the disk. So this is one of the images from our simulation. Black hole is sitting at the center, and uh, there's a question disk orbiting uh, perpendicular to uh, this screen, and left side is brighter because there is a Doppler beaming effect for the matter coming towards you. There's some fringes due to a gravitational lensing effect. Uh, so the motivation of this study is that there's going to be a very high resolution, and, uh, angle resolution and high time resolution observation of such as A using Event Horizon Telescope, which is the largest VLVR telescope in the world. Um, okay, so let me first uh, introduce such as A a little bit more. So uh, again, such as A is a supermassive black hole and uh, it's relatively light, uh, 4 million solar masses and sitting at the distance of 8 kiloparsecs. This is a famous image from UCLA's group that is showing the uh, very massive stars orbiting around a specific point in the sky and uh, with the extremely uh, short orbital time scale. So it is a good evidence that there is something very heavy sitting here, possibly supermassive black hole. And uh, such as A is a compact radio source. Uh, it's categorized as low luminous galactic nuclei, and uh, it emits at um, radio wavelengths uh, due to uh, primary uh, synchrotron radiation from hot and uh, tenuous accretion disk. So this is an uh, uh, example model spectrum from Mos Zebrazka at 2009. So uh, there is, uh, this is synchrotron emission bump that peaks around one millimeter which is 43 at the exact wavelengths that we want to observe at using UHD. And there's another bump here. This it consists of uh, photons, inverse Compton scattered photons from this synchrotron radiated photons. There are a couple of observation data points, including a flaring state in X-ray. The same thing has happened with the infrared um, Flares that usually last a couple of hours, which is a little bit too long time scale variability for the purpose of this study. Uh, so, anyway, the very unique thing about such a say is that it has the largest angle size of event horizon in the entire sky, and angle size is about 50 micro arc second. So, this is larger than the highest angle resolution of event horizon telescope. So, uh, here's more about event horizon telescope. It is, uh, again, very long baseline interferometry, VLBI, uh, that uses worldwide radio telescope networks so that effectively it has a dish size of the Earth. Um, this is a couple of stations that consist of EHT. Not all of these are deployed, but recently LMT has just been added, uh, all the column has been removed, and ALMA and South Pole Telescope will be deployed soon, and we will have uh, full observations uh, in 2017. Uh, actually, there are two more stations in France and Spain. Uh, this is the UV coverage of the Event Horizon Telescope. So, again, the highest possible resolution is about 25 micro arc second, which is less than 50 micro arc second event horizon of the uh, such as A. Um, this is uh, as high resolution as you can identify the orange on the moon's surface. Um, so, with EHT, we, are, we should be able to see a shadow in 2017. Uh, Dolman et al. 2008 has already uh, observed, such as say, using EHT, but they had only three stations, which was Karma, SMT, and SMA. So 
uh, they couldn't really image it because the UV color is too low, but uh, still they could identify the intrinsic size of such say that is about 37 micro arc second, which is again smaller than the, the size of the, uh, the black hole shadow. So the uh, so here's the idea of our study. So we'd like to study a short time scale structural time variability of such a say. So what it means is that, uh, first of all, time variability of such a say contains very uh, valuable information of accretion disk dynamics, um, basically turbulence. And second of all, so there are actually many uh, observations of the time variability of the such a say already performed, but they all used the total flux variability. But now EHT is able to resolve the structure of the, the such a say, so why don't we, we, we don't need to stick to just the total flux variability, but we can actually study a structural time variability of such a say. And the benefit of that is, of course, we are able to access uh, dynamics of turbulence or well, accretion disk at a different special position in the accretion disk. And uh, one thing to note is that uh, variability due to turbulence must be very uh, uh, time variety, uh, time scale is short uh, at the the orbital period at innermost stable circular orbit, which is called ISCO, where the photons orbit the black hole. And the period is about five to thirty minutes, depending on the spin of the black hole. So, uh, if it's due to turbulence, it can be even shorter than that. So, we need very high time resolution observation. So, in our study, we start from modeling um, accretion disk using a numerical simulation. So um, we uh, use uh, this radiatively inefficient accretion flow model, RIF, which is uh, different from the, the very thin accretion disk model used for uh, like AGN that has very high accretion rate and um, bright. While this RIF model, uh, it, the accretion rate is very low and it's tenuous, so uh, it doesn't cool, so it's, it puffs up and it's very hot. And the uh, observational feature of such a say is consistent with the model of real food. I think it's appropriate to use real model for the simulation. Um, even if there is a accretion disk sitting there, you need to somehow transfer angular momentum outward to make the disk actually accrete onto the black hole. So you need some kind of uh, vis sharing, uh, viscous sharing disk. And in astrophysics, usually the viscosity is uh, replaced by turbulence. Turbulence is actually a uh, the uh, MHD turbulence in this disk are uh, induced by magnetic rotational instability, which uh, happens when there is a small polar magnetic field and the sharing uh, differential rotation. Um, so we used a simulation called the general relativistic magnet hydrodynamic simulation, so-called GR MHD simulation. It incorporates all the GR effect and it's conservative code. So this is a video from of the, the actual disk simulation. Orange shows a density, 3D density counter surface. And I put a couple of magnetic field streamlines to show how turbulent it is. Um, white shows the boundary of the jet and the surrounding medium. The natural cause in GRMHD simulation actually. Uh, also it depends on the initial magnetic field configuration. So after we run this GRMHD simulation, we have a set of the, the files result, and we post-process that to make a radiative model. So we perform a radiative transfer, well, G general relativistic ray tracing method that uh, includes synchron emission and absorption at 1.3 millimeter. So the uh, idea of this is that you put a camera at, on the Earth that has several pixels, and from each pixel, you follow, you, you uh, toward the such as A star, you follow um, geodesics of the photons, and as the geodesic get closer to the black hole, it curves like this, the black hole is here. So after you establish the geodesic from each pixel, you integrate the, the, um, the radial transfer equation backward through the disk, and eventually you can construct an image. Uh, and in this process, uh, we included light traveling time. So what it means is that uh, while photons traveling through the disk, this actually evolves. So in the, this kind of short time variability study, you need to incorporate this uh, light traveling time and 
the time resolution for that is uh, about 11 seconds in our study. So these are the movies of the, the radiative model. So this is an uh, edge-on view of the disk. The uh, accretion disk is orbiting in this way. And uh, again, this is Doppler beaming effect. You see these uh, fringes actually from a backside of the black hole due to gravitational lensing. And uh, this is a shadow of the black hole, which is about 50 micro arc second size. This is uh, viewed from 20 degrees from the pole, the pole or the angular momentum axis of the, the disk. Uh, so you see less Doppler beaming effect, but you start to see this uh, nice photon ring here. Okay. So, well, what can we learn from these, uh, these movies? So uh, original motivation of the study is that EHT can resolve the, the structure variability. So maybe it's nice to start from take some portion of this image and plot a light curve and study what's, what's that. The smallest portion possible to take from this movie is actually pixel size of the, the camera. So let's start from the you know, individual example pixel. So this is, again, the edge on view of this uh, accretion disk. Uh, basically, time averaged one of the left side movie, and uh, the color scale is logarithmic, so it looks a bit different. But uh, anyway, you choose one pixel and plot the light curve of that, like this. It's very variable. Uh, the x axis is uh, like three hours. Um, so, uh, in principle, this light curve should include uh, the information of accretion disk dynamics at where the most of the emission is coming from to that pixel, which is basically the geodesics from the pixel is crossing the, the disk. So to further study that, we can take a Fourier transform of this curve. And what you will get is this kind of uh, power, spectrum, power spectrum diagram. So what's interesting here is that there is a frequency that this PSD breaks so in general, uh, and this break frequency appears in so many pixels. So in general, uh, uh, the shape of this uh, PSD is that there is this uh, straight line, which uh, the, the slope is roughly minus 0.5 to minus 1. And then uh, this break happens. And then after that, it's no longer linear uh, slope, but the slope, slope keeps decreasing. And uh, one thing to note is that this break frequency observed here is actually uh, higher frequency than ISCO orbital frequency. So I'll come back to the interpretation of this later on. OK, so let's get more statistics about this break frequency. We do that a procedure to find the break frequency for each pixel for entire pixel and make some map of the distribution break frequency. So again, take a pixel of in each, each, each pixel in the video and make light curve and get a PSD, find the break frequency, and deposit that into each pixel, the value into pixel that has the same field of view as this one, and this is what you will get. So um, there's a very interesting correspondence with the, some morphological feature in the original image and uh, morphological feature in the, this uh, break frequency map. Um, it has very high break, break frequency uh, around the rim of this uh, shadow of the black hole. And it has the, this part, the radiation from uh, in, a, in, a, in a most uh, stable circular orbit of the disk. Um, and uh, this is more interesting. So this is a break frequency map for this uh, face on view. Uh, and uh, you can see that for the emission from inner radi, uh, radii, that it has a higher break frequency. There's some interesting feature like this circle that is actually a photon ring that has Interesting, uh, lower break frequency that's surrounding. Anyway, so let's take a look at more quantitative relation between uh, emission point and the break frequency. So again, these are the break frequency map for edge on view and face on view. And now uh, you want to identify where the emission is coming from for each pixel. 
And usually, most of emissions coming from the, the position that your disk is crossing the equator plane of the disk, although that is not always the case. So let's reduce this uh, parameter of our set of phi to just R and concentrate on the investigating relation between the emission radius and the break frequency. So uh, the, well, we perform this uh, procedure to find the emission point, uh, emission radius for each pixel, and this is the the, the distribution of emission radius that is corresponding to the so same field of view. So uh, blue shows uh, means the emission of, of those pixels is coming from inner radii. And red shows from very large radii. For, uh, for face on view, it is more intuitive that the emission from the inner part of the the image is coming from inner part of the disk. So that's simple, although there's some general effect going on. Now, using these two relations, we can make a plot that relates emission radius and break frequency. So because you know for each pixel there is a break frequency and emission radius. The, each dot is corresponding to each pixel, and green is for edge on view, and red is for uh, face on view. So you can see that there is a very clear relation between emission radius and break frequency, especially for this face on view. There is a very uh, narrow distribution in uh, break frequency for each radius. For edge on view, there is a little bit more uh, uh, scattered in break frequency. So that is because uh, for, um, for the face on view, the geodesic basically crosses just one radius in, in the in the disk, while for the edge on view, the, some geodesics passes a lot of radii, radii in the accretion disk. And although we can determine one emission radius using some procedure, there is actually very extended emission points. So that is, th those uh, light curves are contaminated by those information from uh, outer radii, and that uh, makes some uh, distribution of the break frequency depending on which pixel you are de dealing with. So the question is, how, how accurately this, uh, these dotted lines are uh, recovering the true break frequency radio profile? So here what I mean by true break, race, break frequency radio profile is that suppose that those uh, geodesics just crosses the disk at basically just one zero dimensional point, then you can really recover the entire information of the specific point, the dynamics of the disk. So we mimic that by uh, uh, measuring the variability of emissivity in the accretion disk, in the equator plane, in the actual GRM image simulation. And then uh, take uh, time variability, uh, take a PSD, a Fourier transform of the curve of the emissivity, and uh, find the break frequency. And we do that at a couple of radii. Um, so that we can make this uh, radio profile of you know, true break frequency profile. Um, and that is this black curve. So the black curve and this red curve surprisingly uh, matches very well. So this is really indicating that this break frequency is a good footprint of the dynamics of the accretion disk. So after saying all that, what, where is this break in PSD coming from in the first place? So here's our speculation. Now, break frequency corresponds to upper limit of time variability that emission, radi re emission radius can uh, naturally produce. So what I mean by that is that uh, it's easy to consider uh, something called the hotspot model. Okay, I'm running out of time. Uh, but okay, so in a hotspot model, you can think that there is just one hotspot orbiting around the black hole, and then that, that is emitting light. So if you see that from far away, then that's the orbital time scale of the hotspot is basically the highest um, frequency that that orbit can produce. If you have like multiple hotspots in the same orbit, like three, then three times orbital time scale of the radii is the highest, uh, highest time variability of the emission. The, the radiation you can see from the infinity. And uh, by using the same argument, well, the, our disk is turbulent. There's no hot spots, but we can still define some kind of uh, 
the smallest structure in azimuthal direction at each radius, and that can be uh, estimated by azimuthal correlation length of the emissivity in azimuthal direction uh, at each radius. So 2 pi over the azimuthal correlation length is basically saying the maximum number of hotspots at each radius. So this is this plot is basically saying that uh, this, so this is a radio profile of ratio of break frequency and orbital frequency, which is basically showing the number of hot spots uh, following the hot spot argument at each radius, and that is about 10. There are 10 hot spots at each radius, and that agrees with this uh, radio profile of this um, at 2 pi of azimuthal relationness um, thing. But this is still speculation, and it, it, the, this value depends on the, how to define this azimuthal correlationness. Um, so the fundamental question is, do we, are we really able to measure black frequency in realistic observation? Well, um, as you remember, the highest resolution of the EHT is just 25 micro arc second, and the black hole shadow is 50 micro arc second. So we usually cannot really get the break frequency, the, the beautiful beautiful ones that I have been showing. Um, and also, in your uh, it's um, interferometric data, so the data, it comes, uh, raw data comes as uh, visibility in the UV space. So uh, it is more observer-friendly to, to study this uh, break uh, time variability in the UV space. So this is the uh, edge on views uh, in the UV space variability, and you do the same thing. Each pixel, you find the break frequency and make a break frequency map. So there is this, um, we can still see a break frequency in this UV space. And interesting, the short baseline has a low break frequency and long baseline has, um, has a short break frequency. That makes sense because long baseline can pick up a small, small fluctuation in the image, which corresponds to maybe the fluctuation in the inner part of the disk. Uh, so using that uh, relation, I can make this kind of plot, like baseline length of versus the break frequency. Although these are preliminary values, and eventually uh, we can maybe do that. We observe the break frequency and for the, the 10 giga lambda baseline in AHT to be this value. So using this relation with the emission radius and break frequency, we can find somehow the, we, we are seeing the di accretion disk dynamics of uh, from this radius. Uh, so are we running out of time, basically? OK, so here's uh, I close with summary slide. And thank you very much. Any questions for Hotaka? Uh, do we have any idea at this point uh, what the actual organization is? Is this with respect to us, in fact? Uh, well, there are several studies done by parameter fitting, but well, there are many parameters. I don't quite believe any of those uh, results. So, yeah, that's the state, I think. Yeah.
I also like to impersonate uh, Bernie Sanders. Yes. Uh, what happened? Oops. It worked fine before. Oh, there it is. Okay. Okay, so I'm going to talk about. Uh, let's see. All right. I'm going to talk about a deep Chandra observation of the elliptical galaxy NGG 5044, which is the central dominant galaxy in the X ray brightest group in the sky. Okay. It's a group, so it contains the, ga the hot gas is about a keV. It has a modest cooling flow. The central cooling time is about 40 million years, so far less than a Hubble time. The, the classical mass accretion rate is about 5 to 10 solar masses a year. If you just take the mass and the hot gas, divide by a cooling time, that's what you get. But we know from uh, many studies on the AGN feedback mechanism that the central AGN prevents about 90% of that gas from cooling. So I'm not going to talk about that 90%. I'm going to talk about the 10% that is cooling. Um, and this is an ideal object to study the cooling, the, how the cooling gas forms stars and fuels the central black hole. NGC 5044 has been observed at a broad range of wavelengths. Here's a composite image showing the H alpha, which is a gas about 10 to the 4 degrees. There's Spitzer observation of rho vibrational H2 lines, so gas about 1,000 degrees. There's a paper on Herschel data by Norbert Werner on the detection of uh, C2, which is about 100 degree gas. And this C2 is associated with the photo dissociation region surrounding molecular clouds. And we have ALMA data, which detects a CO with gas about tens of degrees. So you're seeing gas at a range of 10 to the 6 in temperature. So it's a, a good object to search for and study cooling gas. Here's another composite. This, the uh, cyan colored stuff is GMRT data at 235 megahertz. So it shows it has a central AGN. Here's a, a radio lobe in here. But actually the ALMA data we have shows that the central source is a gigahertz peak source. The flux of the AGN is 500 times greater at 230 gigahertz compared to 235 megahertz. And these are people that I've worked with over the years on this object. Okay, Let's, hopefully you can see this. Um, it's hard to put everything into one picture. So I tried to make several pictures. This shows the large scale. And so I burned in the core. There's a sloshing filament, which kind of, or sloshing spiral rather, which kind of runs like this. It's a little hard to see here. But these spiral features are very common for galaxies that are sloshing in the center of groups and clusters of galaxies. And the central galaxy in this group has a peculiar velocity of about 140 kilometers a second relative to the group mean. You can also see there's lots of these filaments, larger X-ray filaments. And these filaments tend to be cooler. This is a 235 megahertz emission. And I'll show you in a little bit that there's actually a more recent outburst. So this material is no longer being powered by the agent. It's just kind of floating up buoyantly and drifting in the wind. And you can see once the uh, gas, the radio plasma buoyantly uplifts past the spiral, it feels more the uh, weather in the group and it kind of bends back a little bit. And there's also this detached radio feature, which could have been some, an older outburst where the relativistic electrons have lost most of their energy, but due to this sloshing motion, they could be being compressed and reaccelerated. And you can see the total time now in, uh, that we have on 5044 is 420 kiloseconds. So that's the large scale. If we zoom in a bit, this is what it looks like on scales of 10 kiloparsecs. And the main thing I want you to notice is very filamentary. And most of my talk is going to be about what's happening in these filaments. And this is an unsharp mass image, so the difference, you smooth the image on two different scales and then you subtract. But you can see many filaments. Now the, the radio cavity is here. It looks like there's a counter radio cavity. We don't see any emission at 235 megahertz here, but it could just be below our sensitivity. But you see these other features here. And the question is, are these AGN inflated cavities? Was the AGN going off in different directions? 
or where these bubbles, once they're inflated and the AGN stops powering them, they just kind of blow in the wind. I'll show you that in the next slide. And this is an image that Joe De Pasquale made. He applied his magic. I mean, it's very hard to show features on a broad, a high dynamic range in surface brightness. But he's able to do that with his magic. And so you can see in here that there is a more recent outburst. There are a couple of cavities in here. So what are these cavities? So if we extract a surface brightness profile in this region, oh, I first want to show, here's the H-alpha image. And so you can show there's some overall correlation between the X-ray filaments and the H-alpha. This region here is kind of down in here. And then there's this region up here, which is kind of consistent with these filaments up here. So there is somewhat of a correspondence between the X-ray filaments and the H-alpha filaments. But I'll show you when you zoom in, there's, they don't line up exactly. Okay, so if we extract a surface brightness profile in this ring, where a zero is due west, so this is the filament here. This drop here in surface brightness is this cavity. And I did this in two energy bands, a, half, a soft energy band, a half to one, and a harder energy band, one to two and a half. And then you can see these two filaments, and that, that little thing in there is right there. So you can see that is not really a cavity. That's the average surface brightness in that ring. It just looks like a cavity because it's surrounded by two filaments. And this here, this is the deep cavity here. But this region in here, again, the surface brightness in that region is the average within that annulus. So that is not a cavity. It just looks dark because it's surrounded by these two bright filaments. So there's really only... So I used to think there were a lot of outbursts. The thing was going off quite often, but there really only evidence for two outbursts. There's the big 235 outburst and that more recent outburst you can see in uh, Joe's image. And I should also point out that the... Uh, the depth of the cavities is much greater in the soft band than the hard band, which is what you would expect. As you're looking through the cluster, you have hotter gas near and far, and the cold gas is all down in the middle of the group. So this is displacing the gas in the middle of the group, the coolest gas. So the cavity is much deeper in the soft band than the hard band. And also this filament here is much brighter in the soft band. So it definitely contains the coolest gas. Okay, this is zooming in on the center. So this shows the recent outburst, which is probably producing the 230 gigahertz emission. So you have these two cavities and a reasonably bright AGN. So there appears to be only two outbursts. Now here, just overlay the uh, ALMA data. These are the locations of, uh, in the ALMA data, we detect 24 molecular clouds. So here I overlaid the positions, and each one of these is the beam size. And this was, uh, this is cycle zero data, so the beam was about two arc seconds. It's much better now. And this is an HST image showing the extinction produced by the dust. And this ellipse is roughly the size of the cavities produced by that central AGN. And so you can see everything lines up nicely. And there was a paper by Pasquale Temi on the Spitzer data. And he suggested that the dust in here was originally in a torus and it was disrupted by an AGN outburst. So that certainly seems reasonable. But now, the molecular gas is about 10 to the 7, assuming a galactic conversion factor. The dis now, if you inflate two cavities, they can only dredge up a mass equal to the mass they've evacuated in those cavities. The space mass is only 10 to the 6. So if this really is 10 to the 7, there's no way these cavities could dredge up that much cold gas, unless the XCO was actually 10 times less. But the dust mass is 10 to the 5. So using a galactic conversion factor, the ratio of gas to dust is about 100, which is a very typical value. And uh, Helen Russell also found this result on a recent paper discussing ALMA observation in parks 0745, that they found that using a galactic conversion factor that the ratio of gas to dust was about 100. So if this is true, if the, the displaced mass in the cavities is only 10 to the 6, then they're not going to have an effect. And this is just the way it was before the AGN went off, and the AGN didn't do anything. I mean, that's certainly possible. 
Okay, just a couple slides going over the ALMA data. Uh, we got, this was cycle zero data. So we have, we detected 24 molecular structures within the central two and a half kiloparsec region. And this is on top of the x-ray data. So you can see the field of view of ALMA is pretty tiny. So we're only detecting molecular gas down in the middle of the, the group. We haven't covered the outer filaments. And I've been submitting proposals the last couple of years trying to map out this central five kiloparsec region, but have not had it approved yet. So the total mass of all these clouds is about 5, 10 to the 7. The velocity dispersion, or, or line width, rather, the line width within e each uh, molecular structure is about 15 to 65 kilometers a second. Typical GMCs are about 5 or less. So th these aren't individual giant molecular clouds. So we, we call them giant molecular associations. And the, the time to supply this much cold gas from cooling is about 10 to the 7 years divided by whatever fraction of the gas actually cools. So if only 10% of the gas actually cools, you could supply all the cold gas in 10 to the 8th years, which is a reasonable number. And that's about the time scale between the two AGN outbursts, about 10 to the 8th years. Here's zooming in on this... Uh, the biggest cloud is in here. It's about 10 to the 7 solar masses. This is a spectrum of that central cloud. And so you can see it's two Gaussians. There's a broad Gaussian and a fairly narrow Gaussian. And the width of this narrow Gaussian is about 5 kilometers a second, which is very typical of a, a giant molecular cloud. So this structure does contain at least one typical giant molecular cloud. If you look at this structure as a whole, if you look at the alpha parameter, which is the ratio of the turbulent kinetic energy to the gravitational potential energy, you can see it's very large. This should be about one for a gravitationally bound system. So the structure as a whole is not gravitationally bound, but it does contain at least one gravitationally bound molecular, giant molecular cloud. So the only way to interpret this is that it's, it's un, this will disperse. If it's gravitationally unbound, it's going to disperse on basically the size of the cloud divided by the velocity dispersion of the embedded GMCs. So it should disperse in about 10 to the 10 million years. Okay, we also see another GMC in absorption against the central AGN. Here's the absorption. The width is about 5 kilometers a second, typical of a giant molecular cloud. So we, we do resolve two individual giant molecular clouds. Now there's ALMA observations been published by Helen Russell and Brian McNamara and more distant clusters. So they're far more distant, so it's, it's impossible to detect the faint emission from an individual cloud. But 5044 is close enough, you can do that. And so you can see, so if we just take the, now the, okay, the, the redshift of this feature is about 260 kilometers a second. The circular velocity in this uh, galaxy is about 325. So you can see it's on mostly a radial orbit. So it's pretty much falling into the black hole in a nearly radial orbit. Now if you just take the estimate on the mass from Bar the galactic scaling relations, if only 1% of the mass of this cloud falls into the black hole with an efficiency of 1%, it could power the, the, the present outburst. So it doesn't take much. Okay, so I mainly want to talk about K chaotic cold accretion, as opposed to hot bondy accretion. There's been a number of numerical simulations presented in the literature over the past few years. And they find that the clouds start to condense out of the hot gas when the ratio of the thermal instability time, which is essentially the cooling time, to the free fall time is less than 10. Now, there's some old papers by Steve Balbus and Noam Soker about the growth of thermal instabilities and cooling flow. And if you just have cooling, no heating, just have cooling, then perturbations tend to oscillate about their equilibrium point due to buoyancy, and these perturbations are slowly advected inward. They never decouple from the hot gas. However, once you add a heating, and it has to be a non-state heating mechanism, which is, means the heating is not a function of density and temperature then you can actually drive instabilities. And so in the numeric simulations, when this occurs, the cold gas starts to rain out of the hot gas. And the rate that the cold gas rains out can be far exceed the bondy accretion rate. 
So here's one of these simulations. So this is the accretion rate of cold gas relative to the bond accretion rate. And so you can see the accretion rate of cold gas can be orders of magnitude greater than what you would predict just from the bond accretion rate. And they actually, in uh, Matteo Gaspari's latest paper, actually puts in a plot and compares it to what you see in 5044. So here's one of these simulations. This is the cool gas that forms through a thermal instability, and they're comparing that to uh, 5044. Now, the cold gas, in any accretion, there's always an angular momentum problem. How do you dissipate the angular momentum? In their simulations, they find that these cold clouds dissipate the angular momentum through collisions and tidal interactions. And also, the cold gas gives you a cold gas accretion, gives you a quicker feedback time or response time compared to a hot gas. For a thin disk, thin disk, the energy dissipates on a viscous, viscous time scale, which is about 10 to the 9 years. Whereas this cold gas will fall in a free fall time, which is 10 to the 6th, 10 to the 7th years, much less. So if in 5044, if the gas can cool for a billion years before the agent responds, you would see far more coal gas than what you see. Whereas if the coal gas only builds up for 10 to the 8th years or so, that would give you about what you see. So the, the creation of coal gas really gives you a tighter coupling between cooling and heating. Okay, so looking at 5044, this is the main part of the talk. I want to find out where is the gas cooling. Okay, so first I need to, this is the deprojected density and temperature profiles for the group. Okay, I need those to determine the, the mass distribution, the free fall time, and the gravitational potential. And you can see for here, this is the Bondi radius, which is actually 1 20th of an arc second for this guy. So we can't resolve it with uh, Chandra. <coughs> Excuse me. This inner point here is about two arc seconds. But I can get some idea of what the density distribution is in this region by extracting a spectrum in here, which also contains the emission from the black hole. So I can fit the spectrum to a parallel plus thermal model and then use the emission measure of the best fit thermal model to get some idea of the density distribution. So basically, here's three different parallel density distributions, so I, and all three of these produce the same emission measure, okay? the observed emission measure within this region. So what can you say? Well, you can say that you know, the density profile doesn't continue to increase this steeply. It must turn over some. And probably it's not as steep as this. So it's probably somewhere in here, but obviously, what the actual density is at the Bondi radius is highly uncertain. But if we just normalize it to 1, you get a Bondi radius, a Bondi accretion rate of 4,000th of a solar mass a year. And that could power, that, that by itself, it could power the AGN. You don't only really need efficiency of that to power the AGN, because AGN is fairly weak. In contrast, if you just assume all the cold gas falls into the black hole in a free fall time, which is an upper limit, you get something a thousand times greater. And within this region, the cold gas is, the mass of cold gas is greater than the mass of hot gas. So there's a lot of cold gas there. And even if this is only one tenth of one percent, the cold gas would still be dominate the accretion of the black hole. Okay, so where is the gas actually cooling? So, from the deprojected spectral analysis, I can compute the ratio of the cooling time or thermal instability time to the free fall time. And this is what it is. And this is the extent of the H alpha and C2 emission. They're both pretty much co spatial. And they, you can see them out to 8 kiloparsec. And lo and behold, this corresponds to a ratio of 10. Now, whenever I drive a number from observations that agrees with theory, I, I usually figure, what did I do wrong? But, uh, I mean, that's what it is. It actually comes out very close. This extent of the H alpha and C2 corresponds to the minimum in this ratio. Now, there's likely to be more H alpha and C2 out here, just lower surface brightness. But even if it's three times the extent, this ratio is still less than 15, 20, somewhere in there. So it's still pretty close. Okay, this, so this shows a comparison between properties of the 10, 10 to the 7th degree gas and the location of 10 to the 4 and 100 degree gas. But where is the hot gas actually cooling? 
So then you can do a deep projected two temperature fit to the inner region. And these spectra are, the fit to these spectra are significantly improved with the addition of a second temperature component. These spectra are not. If you add a second temperature component, it degrades the fit. And again, this radius corresponds to eight kiloparsecs. At the same radius, it looks like there's evidence for two different temperatures in the hot gas. And assuming pressure equilibrium, the volume filling factor of the cold gas is that. And, the, and so you see the volume filling factor is a few percent up to about 10%. The two best fit temperatures are about 0 0.8 to 0 0.4. So the cool gas has already lost half its thermal energy. And the, uh, the gas mass fraction would be twice the volume fraction because of the ratio of temperatures. So in here, the, the mass fraction of the coolest gas is about 20%. Okay, so this is still in an azimuthal sense. So it shows in an azimuthal sense the location where you need two temperatures in the x-ray data correspond to where you see cooler gas. Okay, let's look in <coughs> more detail. So there's a lot in this plot, so I'll go through it slowly. This is the H-alpha, and this is the x-ray. So I just selected various regions, and I color-coded them. So the blue are interesting from an x-ray point of view. The red are interesting from an H-alpha point of view, and the green are uninteresting. You can use those, as, use those as control regions. Okay, so first, let's look at the control regions. So take a spectrum from here. Here it is. That's a single temperature fit, okay, which does perfectly fine. Even though in this entire region, though, I mean, this is all within that 8 kiloparsecs, which is this, the cooling times in all these regions are about the same. The free fall times are about the same. But this gas shows no evidence of any cooling. Now let's compare these two regions here, these two x-ray filaments. From the x-ray point of view, they look almost identical. Really no big difference. So X1, is that right? Yeah, X1 is the red, and this guy, X3, is the black. So you can see X1 is, well, is actually well fit with a single temperature, and X3 has a soft excess. It's also where you have the bright H-alpha region. So there's definite cooling in X3 that you don't have in X1, even though they look almost identical from the X-ray point of view. So now the question is, well, what is the difference? These two regions have the same cooling time, the same free fall time. One shows cooling, one doesn't. I mean, one thing I've tried to answer is, is the gas, as it, is the cooling occurring gas as it's falling in, or is this gas that's been dwelling in the center of the galaxy, being enriched by heavy metals and dust, and then being dredged up, and then cooling? So which way is this gas cooling? But now, if, if this region, is uplifted gas and has been re residing in the center of the uh, cluster for a while, it should have higher abundance. Now, you mainly want to look for iron, which is mostly produced by type 1a supernova, which you get from old stellar populations in elliptical galaxies. But it's very hard to get a good iron abundance in multiphase gas with CCD resolution spectrum. But you can see from the spectrum, if you just look at the silicon line, it's the same. The silicon abundance is the same between these two regions. And you do get some silicon from type 1A supernova. So it does not appear to be uh, due to dredged up material that's producing this excess cooling. So, and this also, this X4 region, it shows evidence of cooling, but there's no H alpha. So I, I just, so I think what you're seeing is just these filaments in different stages of evolution. You have this filament, which shows no cooling. This filament which shows no cooling, I'm, I'm sorry, which shows some cooling but no H alpha, and this filament which shows cooling plus H alpha. So I think there's just an evolutionary sequence from here to here to here. So you're seeing these in later stages of evolution. Okay, so that's kind of a, a bit of a biased way to sample the data. I'm looking for interesting features. How can I do a less biased region? Okay, here's a simulated spectrum with these different temperatures. So this is 0 0.6, 0 0.8, 1, 1 1.2 keV. So you can see from the, the mean here, of the, this, these are the blended iron L lines. This is magnesium, this is silicon. So from the mean here, or the peak rather, you can determine the temperature. But if, you can see if you mix different temperatures, you increase this width. 
Okay, that's one way to detect multi-phase gas is by the width of the iron L lines. And that you can do just from the images and far fewer photons than you need to do a full spectroscopic analysis. So I just generated a bunch of simulated spectra, computed the cumulative photon energy distribution between 0.6 and 1.2, computed the 25th, 50th, 75th percentiles in those distributions. So here I plot the 75th percentile minus 25th. So this is the width, basically, of the iron L line in the KEV versus the median. And these are simulations of single temperature gas. So the blue is a range of temperatures from about 0.6 to 1.2, with the galactic NH and abundance. And then I varied the abundance in NH. And you can see it doesn't make much difference. And these are the points for a two temperature uh, simulation, where the emission is divided 50 50 between the cooler and the hotter component. And, the data, and then I took the data and binned it up to a, adaptively binned it up to a signal to noise ratio of 30. So I have the same sensitivity in reach, each region for detecting cooling gas. And the black points are the data. And so you can see they span the difference between single temperature and two temperature. Okay, so let's make an image, let's make a cut here at 180 EV. So only plot, make an image in regions where the full width, where the width of the iron L line is greater than 180 EV. And that's what you get. The black are regions where it's basically single temperature. The colored regions are where there's evidence for two temperatures. So you can see this method picks out these two filaments in here, where it's multi-phase. As I said before, this region looks single temperature. The two control regions are single temperature. But you also notice it picked out this region out here, which, which is, shows up nothing in the image. You don't see it at all in the image. So the extract spectra from these two regions, T1 is the red, T2 is the, the black. And so you can see T1 does have evidence for soft emission. So there is cooling gas, even though you would never pick out this region from the image. But this method does pick it out. And this region is about twice as far out as all these regions. This is eight kiloparsecs. So when I was, when I was looking at the as mutually averaged analysis, could not detect that region. But you can see there is cooling gas about twice as far out. So here are some typical properties of these cooling, or these thermally unstable filaments. The masses are about a few 10 to the seven. Cooling time one to a few 10 to the eighth. So you get m dots within each region of a tenth or two tenths. So each one of these regions contains about half of the total molecular gas observed in the ALMA data. And the cooling rates are about, uh, what, a few times the, the actual star formation rate. So star formation is never 100% efficient. Pardon? Five minutes. Okay. So the star, the star formation rate in each one of these is probably 10% of that. But you could still produce all the star formation with a handful of these thermally unstable filaments. OK, now we can look at this one filament in a little more detail. This is that one filament which is the most thermally unstable. This is the radio emission. And so you can see it's right next to the radio emissions, which might tell you something about why this is so thermally unstable or why the gas is cooling. Uh, there could be some kind of turbulent interface between the radioplasma and the thermoplasma. And in these simulations, a little bit of turbulence actually helps the cooling. So, extract spectra, so I extracted spectra from these regions. And you can see the uh, sizes of the box get bigger outwards. So it's about the same number of counts. Do a two temperature fit. Again, you only need two temperatures in the inner half. The outer region is well fit by a single temperature. So the volume filling factor of the coal gas in here is about 20%, which means about 40% of the mass. So there's a lot of cooler gas in here. These are the ratio of the temperature. So again, this cooler gas has already lost half of its energy, half of its thermal energy. And here's the M dots of the cold and the hot phase. You can see they're actually equal. In a classic cooling flow model, M dots should be independent of temperature. There's no pileup of gas at a given temperature. So at least in this inner half, the gas is cooling as fast as it can. The AGN heating is not affecting this gas. OK, so I think I talked about how these filaments are thermally unstable. But that just 
doesn't give you a scale. Field length gives you a scale. A field length is where conduction and cooling balance. So cooling scales as volume, or R cubed. Conduction scales as heat flux into a given region, so it scales as R squared. So for a big R, cooling dominates. And you work out the math. This is the radius. So I put down these circles correspond to the field length for a 10% uh, temperature fluctuation. And this is, this is a temperature map here. So you can see the variations in the temperature. And so these fluctuations in the temperature actually could be used to constrain uh, conductivity. Oh, this is for uh, if the conduction is suppressed by 30% relative to Spitzer. Okay, and you can see that there are some temperature fluctuations within this region. So maybe Spitzer conductivity is suppressed even more, but there's always projection effects. It's hard to say where these features are within that sphere. So this is the field length. These are these thermal, these filaments. And this is, this circle corresponds to, encloses a mass of 10 to the 7 solar masses. So about the mass of the uh, cold gas. So I think you can see one thing, which I don't think is a coincidence, these scales are about the same. So that the field length really does set a, a scale for the biggest molecular clouds. And also that if you look at the individual filaments, you know, they contain, you know, again, few 10 to the 7th. Okay, one more thing, velocities. Um, this is a plot. If we assume the cold clouds form and then just fall in ballistically into the central AGM. So the velocity depends on the initial radius and the final radius. And this line here shows if clouds with this pairing of initial and final radii, all these clouds would have a radial velocity of 250 kilometers a second. But this is actually the assuming a radial infall with an angle of 45 degrees relative to the plane of the sky. So pretty much an average velocity. You know, these, with this ratio of initial and final, these clouds would have a velocity of 200 and so on. So the velocity dispersion of clouds is about 122 kil kilometers a second. So that means they've only fallen in a couple of kilometers. I'm sorry, a couple of kiloparsecs. <laughs> and 90% of the clouds have velocities less than 250 kilometers a second. So, they've all, so all the clouds have fallen in from you know, within six, seven kiloparsecs, all within the thermally unstable region. No cloud, again, the gas is thermally unstable within about eight kiloparsecs. So there are no clouds out here would have larger velocities, and we don't see such clouds. So all the clouds have fallen in from within this thermally unstable region. And also it shows that it's not due to a merger. It's definitely the cooling. Okay. Summary, the main point I wanted to make is that, you know, NGC, I forgot the number, 5044, <laughs> hosts many thermally unstable filaments, which likely fuel star formation and the, the AGN. And you are seeing these filaments in a variety of uh, evolutionary stages. Typical parameters, gas mass in these filaments, cooling times, and at least in filament X3, the, the, the M dot of the coolest gas, the, the 0.4 keV gas, is about you know, 0.05 solar masses a year, which is comparable for the star formation rate. And even just that single filament, filament X3, the spectroscopic cooling rate in that filament is 10 times the Bondi accretion rate. So, so cooling gas is, so the accretion of coal gas could easily outweigh the accretion of hotter gas. And uh, that's about it. There's nothing there. Absolutely nothing there. No. No. Yeah, uh, maybe you said that uh, I missed uh, But when you are performing the set of simulations to determine the multi-phase temperature of the plasma, are you choosing the same metallic group or the two components? Choosing the what? I'm sorry. Are you I missed. fixing the metallicity? Oh, the yes. Yes. So did you try to see which systematics you are including? 
I did in the two temperature. In the one temperature, I varied, the, I varied the abundance by a factor of two between the blue and the green. In the two temperature. In the, in the single temperature, and the abundance didn't make much difference. But I, I did not do that for the two temperature. Yeah. Uh, is that because the H alpha gas is, is cooler and is it giving you X rays? What, what's your explanation? I don't know. <laughs> <clears throat> You're right. No. Yeah, no, the H alpha is the brightest here, right. and the X rays are bright. There is a bit of an offset. But the, the radio lobe is here. So there could be some turbulence in this region separating the two. But more than that, I, I don't know. Point four. Oh, yeah. Point right, four. right, right, yes. Uh, there may be one representation of the, the cooler gas. Where are the even cooler ones than that? Where oh, <laughs> I, I don't know. <laughs> no, yeah, I just don't know. I mean, uh, Astro H has the potential of doing that. I mean, uh, unfortunately, with Astro H, I mean, yeah, you'll get a very good spectrum. Well, but you'll get a single spectrum from, uh, you know, about this region. <laughs> So it'll be hard, very hard to interpret. But hopefully you'd be able to resolve the iron L lines and separate out the different temperature components. And then you could see is, you could look, does the abundance vary with the different temperature components? Is there more turbulence in the cooler gas? Something like that. But it, yes, yeah, so it'll be hard to interpret. Uh, so you, you introduced this idea of the giant molecular associations. As yes. The wasn't my idea. It was Francoise Combs, so she liked the name. So, okay, yeah. I'm just wondering if there's if that corresponds to larger molecular complexes in other galaxies. Or, you know, yes. No. I, I, yes, they're not it's unusual. Equivalents in our galaxy. Yes. No. They're it's, they're not unique to this object. No. Yeah. Agree. It with it's hard, and the problem is you know that's what you got. <laughs> I mean all the iron l lines are blended that that's with the c c d resolution, so yeah, all your temperature information is in this one bump, so it's very hard to do a, a more detailed spectroscopic analysis I, I have tried, yes. Right, when you're fitting two temperatures, you're, you know, you're kind of waiting. The real distribution is somewhere in between those two. But just don't have enough information to really uh, more tight to fit a differential emission measure or something like that. Thank you so much. Okay. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. They would say they have similar metallicity. Yes. And uh, I wonder how do this metallicity compare to the various centers?